All right, let's open up in our Bibles, the book of Genesis, chapter 22, as we're continuing this study through the book of Genesis. We're here in our second series called Patriarchs, where we're looking at the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's been a great study. I've been talking to folks. They've been showing me how their, uh, their journals and notebooks are getting filled up with notes which is exciting. As always, there's going to be a number that's going to be popping up on the screen. You can text in your questions. I'm going to be able to take your questions at the end of the service. And so it's a great opportunity. I realize I'm not going to be able to explain everything um, in the way that everyone wants it explained or you have other questions. And so it's a great opportunity to text in your questions. And of course, if you don't have a phone that texts, you can just ask your neighbor if you can borrow theirs. And most often they'll just oblige you kindly. So Genesis chapter 22, this is one of the most confusing and challenging and simultaneously the most exciting chapters in the book of Genesis. It leaves us bewildered until we realize what God is up to. Last week we saw the fulfillment of the promise that God would give Abraham and his wife Sarah an offspring. Remember, They got that promise. It took a really long time. When Abraham was 100 and Sarah was 90, then they have a little son named Isaac. Isaac means laughter. He's the son of promise. He's the one that God had promised. And everything that we had seen in the life of Abraham really was spring training for the birth of his son. The walk of faith. Abraham, the great patriarch of faith. God had given a promise. Years were going by. God's timing wasn't Abraham's timing. There was all sorts of issues as they traveled around and Abraham was concerned about how beautiful his wife was as he went to different places. They even tried to help God out by giving Abraham, Hagar, Sarah's handmaiden. And they had a child named Ishmael. But yet God promised And God intended to fulfill his promise. And in chapter 21, we saw the birth of Isaac. Now, to move into chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, things get really weird because look at what happens. In verse 22, Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. And we all say a collective, huh? I mean, think about this. God had promised Abraham a son, and now God calls out to Abraham. Now, this chapter is one of the most well-known chapters Uh, In Hebrew, they call it the Akedah, which literally means the binding. And I have a a rabbinic commentary on the book of Genesis. That's two volumes. It's about 1,200 pages. And this chapter, next to the very first chapter of creation, is the largest portion of the commentary. And the rabbis make such a strong case that, hey, this is so meaningful to Judaism. And what's amazing is, is that as we're going to study this, we're going to realize that the rabbis don't even know the half of it. Because they don't realize that this is something greater than Abraham and Isaac. This is about another father choosing to offer an even more important son. In the Hall of Faith, Hebrews chapter 11 Abraham shows up multiple times, but listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. It says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Wow. This time of testing for Abraham confirms 
his place as one of the patriarchs of faith. Now, I love this. It says here that God tested Abraham. Now, our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems to be unbearable, do what seems to be unreasonable, and expect what seems impossible. This wasn't a test to produce faith. This was a test to reveal faith. Now, if you come to church, if you spend any time, any time studying the scriptures, going to church, talking with Christians, we talk a lot about faith, don't we? Faith is a very common discussion. But you've heard me say it a lot, and I'll say it a lot over the next bunch of years, as long as God gives me here. The reality is simply that the problem with walking by faith is what? You got to walk by faith. We, as a culture in the West, we love to walk by sight. We make every decision based on this thing is going to happen this way, and then it's going to happen this way, and as all these things happen, then this. And that is not walking by faith. We want to make decisions with all of the information. The Bible says that walking by faith, we have the only essential piece of information, which is what? That God is God. And that God knows what he's doing. And all of the details, the circumstances, we do not have. And that scandalizes the 21st century mind. That's hard for us because we want our five-year plan. We want all the details. We want, I'm going to do this, then this, then this, and then I'm going to get the cherry on top. But oftentimes, we're just simply called to trust the true and living God on a path that makes little or no sense. I want to read that quote again. It's by Warren Wearsby. Our faith is not really tested until God asks us to bear what seems unbearable, do what seems unreasonable, and expect what seems impossible. I'm sure that there's some people in here today, either right here in the sanctuary or listening in online on the live stream, you know exactly what this is for you. God's opportunity for us to learn how to trust him in situations that make no sense. People always say, oh, well, you know, the Bible teaches that God will not give me more than I can handle. And it's always a rude awakening when I say, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that God will never give you more than you can handle. The Bible teaches that God will never give you more than he can handle. And we need to learn that he can handle it. And our ability to handle any circumstance is the reality that I'm not called to handle it. I'm called to cast my cares upon him who cares for me and he handles it. And because he's got it, I'm all good. I can take it easy in the Lord because he's got it. I don't have to get it. He's got it. But it's time for Abraham's faith to be revealed. God's not trying to produce faith in him. He wants to bring to blossom the faith that is already in Abraham. I love it. God said to Abraham, Abraham, and he said, here I am. And I sure pray that like Abraham, each one of us are available to hear God's voice. For a lot of us, it's not now, Lord. I got a plan. I got a, I got a full calendar, God. That simplicity that says, yes, Lord. Here I am, Lord. And I'll be honest with you. As a brother in Christ, this is hard. It's hard in my highly scheduled world. And there's a million things going on. It's hard to simply remain in a heart space where God can say, Daniel, and I say, here I am, Lord. And God says, I want you to go do this. I'll be like, Lord, look, I got the next four weeks mapped out every hour. It's hard to be a tool in the tool belt of the Almighty if you're overscheduled. And listen, I'm not saying we shouldn't get scheduled either. I'm just saying we have to realize that God needs to be the executor of our calendar. 
that if God calls on us for whatever it is, that we be available. I've heard it said many times, God is not looking for ability, but God is looking for availability. I think that's how I ended up in the ministry. I heard about people who didn't have the Bible, didn't know the word. I said, hey, someone's got to tell them. Every time someone said, hey, you know, hey, you want to teach a Bible study? I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm available. I want to be used by God. That a, just the ability to be available. But for Abraham, Abraham doesn't get the tap on the shoulder for the big leagues. He doesn't get, hey, Abraham, I want you to have a, a $20 million or 20 million shekel estate that I want you to play with. I want you to build a mansion. No, verse 2, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. This is absolutely horrific. God asked Abraham for the most valuable commodity in Abraham's world. Notice what he says. And, and you feel the tension. Take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. I want you to take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And I want you to go and offer him as a burnt offering. You see, I, I'm not, I, don't, I was trying, honestly. I, I was sitting back there before I came out. I'm like, Lord, let me build this thing up. But do you, this is not about Abraham and Isaac at all. It is, but this is meant, this whole scene is meant to be a picture of a greater father than Abraham with a greater son than Isaac. This is all about God sacrificing his only son, the son whom he loves, Jesus of Nazareth. We're going to see that God is not going to let Abraham sacrifice Isaac because Isaac isn't a worthy offering, but God will sacrifice Jesus because Jesus is the better son than Isaac, the more perfect sacrifice. And that's why this is happening, because God wants a testimony for future generations that when they see Jesus of Nazareth sacrificed on one of the mountains right in the area of Moriah where they ended up building the temple, one of those mountains outside, everyone say, wait a second, I heard about this before. I heard about this. We saw this in the life of Abraham. So God is asking Abraham to do what only his heart is willing to do. God's heart. Because God will sacrifice his own son. Now look at what happens in verse 3. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place where God had told him. And on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. Here's Abraham again, without any delay, early in the morning. I've been, I've been kind of camping out on this with Abraham, haven't I? Every time I see it, right, I make a point. Obedience, without delay, without dilly-dallying, without questioning. He, God says, I want you to do this. And Abraham's up early the next morning, ready to serve the Lord. It's interesting, all this, he's up early. He saddles his donkey. He brings two of his servants with him, two young men, Isaac, his son, and he splits the wood for the burnt offering. I like this. Abraham is making preparations to worship the Lord. See, we live in a culture that loves spontaneity as a sentiment. Like, most of us don't really live very spontaneously, do we? But we just think that spontaneity is really like a cool thing. But we spend most of our lives planning everything, right? But when it comes to the things of the Spirit, we almost spend no time planning. We think that if it's spiritual, it needs to be spontaneous. But the reality is, is that for all of us, we need to make preparations in worship. It's interesting that in the church in, 
in, in Corinth, when they got together for their agape feast and their services on the Lord's Day on Sunday, Paul says, how is it that every one of you comes with a psalm, a hymn, and all these things? See, the people were seeking God all week for revelation to bring to the fellowship of believers. And I like that because they were preparing themselves. They were like, Lord, I want to worship you. When was the last time you prepared to show up at church and worship God? And not just prepared by putting on perfume and arranging your hair and, you know, putting on five different outfits to see which one makes you look the spiffiest for the Lord. But when was the last time you really said, God, when I get into the sanctuary with the people of God, I want my heart to already be open to you. And God, I want to show up before you with my brothers and sisters already overflowing with who you are. We prepare for everything except for the things that matter most, which is the things of God. I, I love this because Abraham's up and he's, he's thinking ahead. He's like, okay, it's a burnt offering. I need some help. I need my donkey ready. I need some wood. I'm not going to just pretend, hope that wood shows up there. I'm going to bring it with me. He made preparations to worship the Lord. And he goes. Notice this. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. This is fascinating, isn't it? Why three days? It was as if in Abraham's mind, Isaac had already been dead for three days. Could you, could you imagine being Abraham? You've waited all this time and Isaac is there. And you're walking and you know what God said and you're just like, you're walking for three days. And can you imagine how often he got choked up in those three days looking over at Isaac, thinking to himself, man, my only son, the son of my love, the son of promise. But on the third day, he showed up at this region in Moriah, According to 2 Chronicles chapter 3, verse 1, Mount Moriah was in modern-day Jerusalem. Early Jewish tradition tells us that the temple was built on the mountains of Moriah. Fascinating. It's beautiful. Now, in verse 5, it says this, And Abraham said to the young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. He leaves the two servants with the donkey and Abraham and Isaac go to worship. Notice what he says at the end here. And we will come back to you. Wow. Does he say, I will come back to you? No. He says, you guys stay here and we're going to go worship and we're going to come back. Remember what I read? Hebrews eleven seventeen to 19. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac and he would receive the promises offered up his only begotten son of whom it was said in Isaac, your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Abraham was so full of faith full of conviction. He's saying, look, me and Isaac are going to go over there. We're going to worship and we're going to come back. And in Abraham's mind, it says that even if he has to thrust that knife into Isaac, he believes that God's going to raise him from the dead because God told him, in Isaac, your seed shall be called. I mean, this is radical faith, isn't it? If you really think about it, you're like, man, but all, all Abraham is doing is trusting in what God's Word says. That's all he's doing. God had said these things. We have them in, in this book, the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation. And Abraham is simply standing on the promises of God. 
And that's all God asks us to do. Stand on His promises. Stand on the truth of His Word. Don't doubt. It's fascinating here. In verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. What is the wood a picture of in the Bible? The cross. Listen to John chapter 19, verse 17. Speaking of Jesus, and he, bearing his cross, went out to the place the, called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. The father lays the cross, the wood, on the son. It's interesting that Abraham keeps the fire and the knife for himself. The fire, of course, is a symbol of judgment. It's always been. Fascinating. It's Isaac's job to bear the burden, the wood. Now, what's also fascinating here, Isaac is called a lad. But that word in Hebrew, when we think of a lad, we think of like a little guy, like a five-year-old or a seven-year-old or maybe a 10-year-old. The rabbis have Isaac in his 30s at this point. He was still, I mean, you got to think, for Abraham, Abraham's over 100 now. So the reality is, is that, you know, anyone's young when you're 100, seriously, you know? But, the, but it's awesome here because Isaac is called a lad, a young man still. But Isaac is there. He's bearing the burden. Now, in verse 7, it says this, But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Verse 8, and Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Can you imagine Isaac at this? He's looking around. He's thinking, man, my dad, what's he doing? We got the fire. We got the wood. Where is the sacrifice? Who's the sacrificial lamb? And Abraham says something so riveting. Look what he says. And I don't really, I'm not like an underline your Bible kind of a guy because it's all God's word. But if you're an underliner of your Bible or if you don't like to, maybe you want to do your neighbors for them or something, I don't know. It says this, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering. Who's going to provide the lamb? God. God's going to provide the lamb for himself. God's going to bring the worthy sacrifice. And so they went in verse 9. Then they came to the place of which God had told them, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Verse 14, and Abraham called the name of this place, the Lord will provide, or Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. You gotta love Abraham's faith and obedience here. Very simply, he was there, he built the altar, he placed the wood on the altar, and then he bound his son and he laid him on the altar on the wood. Now imagine this Abraham is 130 at the time or something, and Isaac is a 30 year old. And it's so easy just to focus on the faith and the obedience of Abraham, but what about the obedience, faith, and submission of Isaac? 
You don't think Isaac could have bo- couldn't have body slammed his dad? Why was Isaac so compliant? Of course, because this is the perfect picture of Jesus. She said, no one takes my life from me. I give it up of my own free will. See, Isaac was equally faithful to God. He trusted that his father knew best. And no doubt, you can imagine Isaac. We don't have it in the text, but you think about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing that in just a few hours, he was going to experience all of the wrath that God had against sin. Now you got to realize that Jesus being fully God from eternity past into eternity future, he knew the seriousness of what was coming. And he knew for the first time in his entire, in all of eternity, he was going to be separated from God. All of the, the weight was going to fall upon him. And he ended up in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was arrested. And he takes three of his disciples. He's like, listen, you guys, you guys just hang out with me for a moment. And it says he was deeply distressed. So much so that he was sweating drops of blood. And he's crying out, Father, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. But not my will, but yours be done. Could you imagine Isaac as his father is telling him to get on the wood, taking those straps and binding him down. Could you imagine the inner turmoil of Isaac? It's amazing that when Peter tried to protect Jesus from, from being arrested, Jesus is like, Peter, what are you doing? I could call down a legion of angels. He's saying, look, this is God's plan. When they mocked Jesus from the cross, When he was there and they said, if you are the son of God, get yourself down off of there. And Jesus could have come down with no problem. But God's glory and care for humanity kept him there. See, they mocked him not even understanding what God was up to. And people today probably even people in this room, you're here, you've you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus. You're like, I just don't get it. Listen, let me explain to you what, what you're missing. The reality that God loves you so much that he would punish Jesus in your place for all the mistakes you've made. And each one of us, if we're even a little bit self-reflective, we're like, we've made millions of mistakes. Some that everyone knows about and some that are just the motivations of our hearts. I always say, man, people don't even know the half of the garbage that's in my heart. Some of you have seen some of it, and you're like, oh, hey, Daniel's got to grow there. But man, this, that's just the stuff that's above the surface. Modern psychologists will tell you that only 10% of a personality is above the surface for people to see. They call this the iceberg principle. 10% is seen because only 10% of an iceberg is above water. The other 90% is below the waterline. And what people know about us and what is really in the depths and the seats of who we are, our hearts, God sees all of it. We're all naked and open before him. God doesn't miss a thing. And God loves us so much that he would not punish us for our mistakes. But he said, look, you can't bear that weight, but my son can And my son will because of the love that I have for you. And you know, I I can get somebody not believing it, but if you really understood it, you should want it to be true. Even if you haven't agreed with it, you should want this to be true. That the almighty creator and sustainer of the universe cares so much for you that he would send his son to die in your place so that you can live the life that we couldn't have anyway. That is the most glorious reality. That's why it's called the gospel, the good news. And all God asks asks of you and I is that we respond to this good news by simply saying thank you and receiving it. Just as somebody hands you a gift. You could say, well, listen, I don't want that gift. I've never met someone who does that. If I, if I show up at home 
And Obadiah, he just graduated from kindergarten. Super cool guy. And if I say, Obadiah, you graduated from kindergarten. I got a gift for you. He's not gonna be like, well, I don't want it. <laughs> nope. Mm-mm. I don't really think it's a gift. Actually, I don't even think you're real, Dad. I mean, <laughs> you, got, you see how crazy it is when you think about it. God's saying, look, I love you so much and this is what you need. Maybe you didn't want it, but this is what you need. And all he asks us to do is say, thank you, God. Say, thank you. And that's what faith is. Faith is simply the hands that receive the free gift of God. And that gift is heralded to everyone. You could just take it. But so many people be like, I don't want it. Nope, no thanks. Nope, I don't think I need it. And it's amazing that when people don't want to receive it, then they're like, well, how can I believe in a God who's going to send people to hell? I mean, who wants to believe in such a God? And it's like, come on. You're like the person who has an illness that is, you're going to die because of it. And the doctor comes and says, look, here is the antidote. Just take it. And you're like, I don't, I don't think it's the antidote. Nope, nope. And then you die and you're mad at the doctor. Like, it's, it's, it's highly illogical. It's highly illogical. The doctor, the great physician, the almighty God said, look, you are dying without this. So here it is. And we have to simply say thank you. And then we have life abundant here and eternal in the hereafter. But you can't say, I don't want to believe in Jesus because I don't believe in God, but, and how could I believe in a God who will send people to hell? That, those two statements don't fit together. They're illogical. God, see, Jesus willingly went to the cross because he knew it was the way of God to save sinners. For the joy that was set before him, Jesus endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated down at the right hand of the Father. This is our hope. So there he is, Isaac, bound. Abraham, raising, raising that knife up. And then in verse 11, the angel of the Lord once again, that messenger of God who's already spoken to Hagar twice now speaks to Abraham. Abraham, Abraham, and Abraham is still very open to God. Here I am, Lord. And he says, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. He said, look, don't touch him. Leave him alone. I know now your faith has been seen in full blossom. We have revealed that you indeed fear God. We know fearing God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of knowledge. That's a prayer that I think we need to start praying. God, teach me to fear you. Now, we live in a day and age where people say, oh, well, who wants to fear God? Let me explain to you why we want to fear God. I believe the fear of God really has two focuses. One focus is that we fear God's authority and sovereignty. Just a, a couple months ago, we had a, 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 a candlelight vigil for the, the sheriff's department in our parking lot. It was really funny. It wasn't funny, but, you know, afterwards, I was sitting, I was talking with some of the sheriffs, and we were meeting them, and uh, one of the sheriffs comes to our church, and he kind of set it up, and I'm talking to one of these sheriffs, and he was telling me, he's like, there's nothing worse than having to get somewhere in a hurry when you're in a squad car. And I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, Everybody just goes the speed limit. <laughs> and so me, I'm just like, hey, this is an interesting conversation. I'm like, so would your recommendation be that when the squad car is behind me, I shouldn't go the speed limit because that would make them kind of upset? And he's like, well, I don't want to tell you to not do the speed limit. But when you're in a squad car, everybody obeys the laws completely. And, he, and he's like, and it's really frustrating. He's like, and I, I don't bring my wife in the squad car because she just gets crazy. 
And I thought to myself, I'm like, this is a great example. Why? Nobody does the speed limit all the time, but except when there's a squad car behind you. Why? Because we know that that policeman has the authority to pull us over and give us a ticket. Right? When was the last time you were going the speed limit, you looked in your rearview mirror, you saw a cop, and you still got scared? It happens, right? Right? You're like, you're driving just fine. You're not doing anything wrong. But you look in your rearview mirror, you see that squad car, and the fear of God jumps into your heart. You're like, oh my goodness, there's a cop. You're looking at this, you get all nervous, your palms get sweaty. You haven't done anything wrong in 20 years. And you're like, Ugh. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? Why? Because you see that squad car and he, that police officer, has the authority to just give you a ticket. We fear the authority of the police. How much more so should we fear the one who can't, doesn't only give us a ticket, but consented us to an eternal damnation? There is a very healthy fear. I love my kids. But when my son's doing something wrong and I give him the look, he stops cold. He, well, I just called him just yesterday. You know what it's like when they'll, to get your little kids to eat the last bit of breakfast? So sure enough, you know, we're, we're fun parents. So we got like the, we got the canister of whipped cream. You know, so like you get almost all your oatmeal done. We're going to get you to finish it. We just bust the whipped cream canister out and put a little, uh, just, uh, just a little dab. You guys know, you guys like to eat like this, right? And, and, our, and our kids' teachers love this. You know, we just sugar them up before they get to school. But, but you know what happens when you put the little dab of whipped cream on top of the oatmeal to get Obadiah to finish the rest. He just licks the, uh, the whipped cream right off and he waits for you to not look and then he takes a beeline for the, for the fridge to get the whipped cream canister and put a little more on there. And sure enough, I was doing something else and all of a sudden I heard the whipped cream canister hit the ground and Obadiah looked up. <laughs> and I'm like, what are you doing? And he was just like silent. He got busted with the whipped cream, you know? I didn't even have to say anything. He just went and sat down, grabbed a spoon and started eating. You know, and I love my son, and he gave me that little smile out of the corner of his face. He knew I wasn't going to get upset with him. But he got scared because he got busted. That's one way we fear God. We should fear God's authority to pass judgment on our lives. That's one way. The other way is that we should fear to break God's heart. It's one of the ways I talk to my kids. I'm like, look, whatever you do, you never make your mama cry. We should love God enough that we fear breaking his heart. I think between those two ways, that's a healthy way to view God. Because we don't just want to, you know, sometimes we get real casual with the father. Oh, he's just my dad. No big deal. You know, like he, some people think that God is like his, you know, you can go have a pint with him or something. Very overly casual. I'm like, listen, man, he, he's the almighty one the all-seeing one, the one who in love will judge humanity. And at the same time, we should have such a loving relationship with him that we don't want to break his heart because we love him. Abraham's fearing God. Now I love this because look at what happens in verse 13. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. So Abraham went took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of this place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide as it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. God's provision of a lamb. And I love it. The name of that place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide for on this mount the Lord will provide. And all of this is pointing to some thousands years later when Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, is sacrificed. Romans 8, 32, you did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? 
Now look at what happens in verse 15. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of your enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. And Abraham returned to his young men and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt in Beersheba. Now once again, we get a reiteration of God's covenant. Because Abraham has been obedient, blessings and multiplication, like the stars of heaven, like the sands of the seashores. We've already seen these in in Genesis 15, and Genesis 13, and Genesis 17. All the nations will be blessed in you. We saw this in Genesis 12, 3. Genesis 18, 18. We're going to see it again in Genesis 26, 4. Over and over and over again. And we get Abraham returning to Beersheba, where we saw him worshiping last week. Now, glorious chapter, but it's not over yet. Look what happens in verse 20. Now it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Indeed, Milcah also has borne children to your brother Nahor. Huz, his firstborn. Buzz, his brother. If you ever have twin boys, Huz and Buzz waiting to be taken. (laughs) That's not in the Bible, just so you know. You're like, where's that? I always told Lynn, if we have twin boys, we're going to name them Huz and Buzz. And she just gives me the eye roll. I think it's great, you know, Huz and Buzz. Never, I'll keep going. <laughs> Kemuel, the father of Aram, Chesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlash, and Bethuel. And Bethuel begot Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother. His concubine, whose name was Rema, bore Teba, Gahem, Tahash, and Maacha. Now, You might say to yourself, man, this was a great chapter. Why do we get a list of names? And I'm here to tell you that this has to be right here. Think about it. Abraham the father was asked to offer his son, right? And we know all of this is a picture of God offering Jesus, right? Now we get this genealogy about the family of Nahor, right? And Nahor is Abraham's brother. Now, what's all this about? Isaac was as if he was dead, but God provided. And in resurrection, when God sacrificed Jesus and Jesus rose from the dead, what was born? The church, the bride of Christ. And right there in verse 23, and Bethuel begot Rebekah. And we're going to be seeing in chapter 24 that Isaac is going to be wed to a gal named Rebekah. Right here. So this genealogy, it's perfect because you have the father offering the son, the son in a figurative sense here, realistically for Jesus is risen from the dead. And right after that, we need to find the bride. It's the perfect picture. It's the perfect picture. I mean, you do not have the death and resurrection without the birth of the bride of Christ, the people of God, those who are called into covenant relationship with the risen and glorious Son of God. So next time you see a list of names in the Bible, don't just jump over and say, I wonder why this is here. It's amazing. Whoever compiled the book of Genesis and the whole Pentateuch, they didn't even realize some of the things that they were doing. They didn't even have the whole picture. But the Spirit of God inspiring them to pen these things and put them together knows exactly what He's doing. They're needed. You can't have the death and resurrection picture of Jesus without the birth and the entrance of the bride. It has to be here. And it's perfect as God's Word always is. I want to close with just an application. We've talked about Jesus. We've seen His willingly giving Himself. But all of this, all of this 
points to the entrance of the bride. And if you're here today and you've put your faith and trust in Jesus, then we are the bride of Christ. Now, I know for some of us guys, it's just really weird talking that way, not looking to be a bride to any other guy. But really, real men are the bride of Jesus. Straight up. I know it's a weird way to say it, especially in this environment that we live in, but it's true. If you put your faith and trust in Jesus, you are part of the family of God. The Holy Spirit sealing your life is the engagement ring for the return of Jesus. If you're in here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus, I want to encourage you right where you are just to say, God, thank you. I receive. I receive this gift. I don't even understand it, but I just say, thank you, God. Let's bow our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the testimony, the faith of Abraham. We thank you for the faith of Isaac, his son, who went willingly. Lord, we thank you that you, a greater father than Abraham, provided a greater son, Jesus, to offer a fitting sacrifice for us. And Father, we just say thank you. Thank you for making us part of your family. Thank you for letting us be the bride of Christ. We thank you for the perfection of your word. Have your way in our hearts. And we ask it all in Jesus' name and all of God's family said, Amen.